Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Parking's kind of nuts this morning, huh? I don't, know, like, I don't know why they close. And, never mind. Anyway, I don't know, we don't need to get into that. Anyway, for those of you guys who I haven't had the opportunity and the blessing to meet, my name is Matt Sujimura. Um, I have the privilege of serving here on C4's teaching team and helping out here and there. Um, it's been a minute since I've been up here. My day job downtown gets a little hectic during the springtime, so I haven't been able to come up here, but um, very honored and privileged to be able to come up here and share God's word with you today. But how many of you guys were here last week or heard... Pastor Chad's message caught it on YouTube. There's such a powerful word last week that Pastor Chad brought about the tension, right, between this old self and the new self and the need for transformation to really be able to choose the wisdom of God. And if you recall correctly, when Pastor Chad was talking us through, in order to kind of choose this wisdom from God, to choose the ways of God, what we really came down to was this need to encounter Jesus, Right, and this need, this encounter with Jesus is the true place where transformation transformation in our life happens, where we can really start to pivot from this old way of not just being a souped up or improved version of our old self, but really stepping into being a new creation in the Lord. And so today, where I really want to start us off with is a couple of truth statements, okay? The first one is this, that God desires to encounter us. Right? It's not just about, oh, God's up there and maybe he'll answer me, maybe he'll not, maybe he's a little too busy. You know, I know it's not football season, but God's got soccer or tennis or you know, pickleball maybe nowadays to start watching. Um, but it's, it says in the Bible in Jeremiah 29, right after verse 11, in t- verses 12 through 14, that then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Right, so we know that this encounter is a two-way street. God desires to encounter us just as much as we desire to encounter him. But let me ask you this. Where do you encounter God? So I'll give you four options. How many of you guys feel like you encounter God in the office? Oh, there's a couple hands. Here we go. Yes. Here I was like, I had total damage from work, and I'm just like, no, God exists everywhere except in the office place. Absolutely. So some of us encounter him in the office, right, with our coworkers' interactions. Sometimes maybe it's just at the coffee coffee station when we get a little bit of a break. How many of us encounter God at home? In our, with our families, maybe it's in our quiet times, prayer times, our prayer closets, whatever may, you may have. How many of us encounter God outside? I know this is a picture of the beach, but maybe it's nature or it's a hike. It's out somewhere else in nature, some of us. How many of us encounter God at church? Oh, thank goodness. Here I was, I was like, uh-oh, this would be super awkward if no one raised their hands right here. See, but if you looked around, God has encountered many of us in multiple places. As a matter of fact, in all four of these areas, someone has encountered the Lord. Right? And so what does that tell us? Not just that God desires to encounter us, but that God encounters us anywhere. Could be here, could be outside, could be with a friend, could be with other believers, could not be with other believers. It could be anywhere because God can meet us anywhere. But here's the thing, right? We know these things to be true. Intellectually, in our minds, we can tell ourselves and we remind ourselves, no, God desires to encounter me. God can encounter me anywhere. But aren't there seasons in our lives where it feels like encounter kind of misses us? Like, I've done everything I could to put myself in a position to meet with the Lord, and for some reason, it just kind of like, whoop, skips over me. I get this image of like Mario jumping across the, jumping across the game, right? Because it could be in this situation where, I mean, I read my Bible, I pray every day, come to church every Sunday, I joined a circle, started serving, started leading. But for whatever reason, you know, I just don't really feel that connection anymore. Or why does it seem like I don't hear your voice? I'm not really getting as much revelation or guidance anymore, but I see it happening around me, with people around me. It seems like everyone else's prayers are getting answered. Like I see and hear of people getting amazing healing experiences, healing touches from the Lord, 
But I'll be frank, my left ankle is still super bust. I can't play basketball. <laughs> or, you know what they say in those seasons of singleness? If you just stop looking and trying so hard, God will bring the person around to you. And I tried that. Thank God it worked. But <laughs> when you're walking through that season, it doesn't always feel like there's hope at the end of that tunnel. I mean, maybe you've been looking for community, but people just seem too busy. I don't want to burden people. I don't want to inconvenience people. But where does that leave me? I mean, it, it also feels sometimes, I know I struggle with this, everyone else seems to have encounters but me. And I'm a little too scared. I'm a little too ashamed. I'm a little too embarrassed to start asking about it. I keep hearing about these testimonies from other people having these amazing, miraculous encounters with the Lord. But to be honest, I don't experience stuff like that. Am I even capable of feeling those things, of experiencing those things? See, and as we continue in this place, it gets harder and harder to celebrate what the Lord is doing in other people's lives because it just feels like I'm going nowhere fast. But the thing is, what this really asks, begs the question, is that what is the actual purpose of encountering the Lord? God's desire for encounter is relationship with you. That's the whole point. He encounters us to, so that we might draw nearer to him, have a relationship with him. Because as we grow with him, and we grow in relationship with him, our trust and our faith in him continues to build, which spurs on this heart of wanting to walk in obedience with the Lord, to see all the goodness that God has planned for us. But the thing is, a lot of the times, our desire for encounter is problem solving. I'm going through some stuff, and I need an encounter with the Lord to help me with it. Because when stuff is good, Lord, you're so good, I'm just going to sing your praises at the top of my lungs, 24-7, 365. You're good. I don't need anything from you right now because everything is solid. Family's good. Work's good. Bills are getting paid. I'm saving up for that vacation we're going on soon. But see, when we get caught up focusing on resolving the issues or the circumstances in our life, and we try to walk in obedience without a relationship with God, we can end up in this place where we start feeling like we're living a life of obligation, where we start living out of performance, because I'm doing what God told me to do. I don't really know why, don't really know his heart for it, don't really care, because I'm supposed to do these things in order to get the thing that I'm after, in order for me to solve this, this problem in my life, in order to resolve this conflict that I'm going through. And as we keep seeking these results and these solutions, and we don't find them, we can end up in a place where we feel scared, exhausted, discouraged, depressed, burnt out, abandoned, and frankly, just jealous of other people. How many of you have ever felt like that before, or been in that position? It's exhausting. It's like nothing you do will ever get you to where you need to go. Now, in the Bible, there's some encouragement in this through the prophet of Elijah. He's an Old Testament prophet, big, big presence in the Lord. And we find him first in 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to kind of breeze through this really fast. So if you have your Bible and you want to know more about Elijah, please, I encourage you to go back because I'm going to have to breeze through some of these things really quickly in order to, to get, through all, get through it all. But we first encounter Elijah. In 1 Kings 17, so at the time, Ahab is the king of Israel. Now, this is King Ahab of Israel, not Captain Ahab, Moby Dick, named after the same guy, arguably very similar personalities, but there's no white whale in this story. So Ahab is king. Ahab gets married to this woman called, named Jezebel. Some of you might have heard that name before as well. 
Now, Jezebel was a Canaanite. Basically, she was not a believer in God. She actually believed in this other deity named Baal. Okay, and so like a good husband, happy wife, happy life, started following Baal instead of Yahweh, instead of our God. And in return, a lot of what started to happen is that Israel started to turn away from the Lord and started following Baal because all these altars and these worship stones were being placed for Baal instead of God. So what happens? We see Elijah come in, 1 Kings chapter 17, and he predicts a three-year drought. Now after this, after he confronts Ahab and tells him there's going to be a drought because you have left the presence of the Lord, the Lord tells him, okay, now go and stay by this stream. And he ends up leading him to this, to this widow, to stay with this widow. Now, it's important to note here, along the way, when he's running away or when he's kind of escaping from Ahab at this moment, when he's being led by the Lord, he stays next to this stream. And literally every day, the Bible says, a raven came down and brought him food and he drank from the stream. Now, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge Ravens fan, um, but it's clear here, right? Like, I mean, let's be honest, if we sat outside and a pigeon brought us, brought us some food, that'd be pretty amazing. I would probably not eat it just out of sanitary purposes, but still. And when he goes and stays with this widow, at the end of this story, the, widow, the widow's son actually ends up getting sick and passes away. But Elijah being a man of God, prayed for the son, and he was actually resurrected. And then we see him come back after, this, after all this time, after literally being essentially a walking encounter with God. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if we had had this exact same timeline, pretty sure we'd be going just about everywhere proclaiming the good news of the Lord every second of every day. He goes back and he confronts Ahab again. This time, he challenges the prophets of Baal. Now, the Bible says that there, are, there were a 450 prophets of Baal that Elijah essentially goes up and says, Ahab, you bring your prophets, bring all of Israel, bring two ox. We'll put them on the altar, build an altar out of wood, and we're each going to pray to our God. Whichever God comes down and consumes the offering, that's the God who's, who's God of everything. That's the more powerful God. Now, of course, 450 to 1, I mean, of course you're going to take those odds, right? So they go, and they're on their way, and the prophets of Baal cut up their ox, put it on the altar, lay it on the, lay it on the wood, and they start praying like crazy, and nothing happens. They get to the point where they start cutting themselves and crying out loud, and nothing happens. And the good prophet Elijah, the humble, great man of God, started laughing at them. <laughs> he, starts, he laughs at them and says, look at you. Look at you and all these things you're doing and nothing's happening. And just to double down and prove to you how mighty my God is, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to soak my offering in four vases full of water to the point where there's a little moat around my thing and the wood is completely soaked. Now, I don't know how many of us have ever gone camping before in the rain, but trying to light wet wood on fire is like one of the most frustrating things in, in the world, honestly. And yet, after all of this is done, Elijah gets on his knees and prays and asks the Lord to send down his all-consuming fire. And in that very moment, the fire comes down and not only consumes the offering, but every single drop of water that was poured. Imagine being in that space right there. Imagine the equivalent happening in our life where it's such an undeniable sign of the Lord and it happened in front of everybody. What would you expect to happen after that? Probably that, I don't know, maybe Israel will realize that God is God and we should stop following this other person or this other fake thing. But what actually happens? Good old Jezebel, who is, who's the one who grew up worshiping Baal, 
sends a message to Elijah and says, so may the gods do to me and more also if I, do, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Jezebel doesn't turn to God and acknowledge his sovereignty and his might and his power. She wants to kill the messenger, Elijah. Now, what does Elijah do? He was afraid, he arose, and he ran for his life. Now, it's easy to sit here and be like, well, yeah, of course, duh, He's, his life was threatened. But keep in mind, this is right after this amazing sign from the Lord of all-consuming fire just came down, when, when arguably our faith, his faith would be at its peak. And you're telling me that he just turned and ran because of some queen that said something about killing him? Like, hello, does, did God not just prove who God is? But yet it's a completely relatable situation, right? How many times have we been in a situation where God is clearly moved in our life and in a, in a moment's notice something flips and we're just, we're suffering fear, anxiety, we're sad, and we just, we just lose sight of it, just one degree. So we see Elijah running. He leaves his servant in the kingdom of Judah. So he's going alone. And many of, some of you guys might have read this part of the passage before. But here Elijah is, sitting under a broom tree. And he asks in prayer to the Lord, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. This man of God, who prayed for a drought, then prayed and resurrected a kid, and then prayed and brought down God's fire, I think we can come to this point where we understand Elijah probably knows a little bit about the power of prayer. <laughs> and here he is praying to die. As if for him, none of this was worth it. He'd done everything that God had guided him to do. And yet he still feels like, Lord, I don't, I don't know what your plan is, but I've had enough. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. It'd be easier for me to just be dead than to keep going on. I don't want to do this. I'm not even as good as my fathers were before me. Start comparing myself to other people. And you can, you can see how he just starts emotionally going deeper and deeper into this hole. And just in that moment, he looks, and there's a cake, bread, hot piece of bread on a hot stone with a jar of water. And he ate it and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. He arose, ate, drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. Sorry, I must have cut off the first part, but it's the angel of the Lord who also brings him this food. Now, whenever, and I don't know, maybe some of you guys have been in this situation where it really feels like there's complete, there's, it's hopeless, there's no escape, there's no running, there's no nothing that I can do. I've exhausted every single option, and it just doesn't feel like it's ever going to go anywhere. It's never going to be enough. Lord, I've prayed to you. I've tried all of that. Nothing's happening. If in that situation in our own life, an angel of the Lord showed up and said to you, hey, uh, Pastor Brett, here's some food. You probably want to get checked into a mental institution at that point and wonder, oh, what, who, what, who is this thing? And is this food real? Am I seeing? Am I hallucinating? And then a second time, the angel of the Lord taps him and says, hey, man, we got to like eat. You got to keep going. See, if we were to have a tangible encounter with an angel of the Lord in our life, pretty sure that would be all we would need in that moment to go on and declare, man, I was down in the dumps. I hit rock bottom. An angel of the Lord appeared to me, and here I am completely saved. And that would be an amazing testimony. 
wouldn't it? But a lot of times, just like Elijah, we can overlook the ways and the movings of the Lord because we're just stuck in our own circumstances. We're continuing to look for these solutions, look for figuring out a, a resolution to my circumstances. See, because for a lot of us, it might not be an angel of the Lord that shows up in our life, but God can move in the hearts of the people around us. He can move in the heart of your friend. He can bring them to come in, even if it's just to check on you, to talk things through, to make sure that you're not alone, invite you out to hang out, to do something. This interaction right here can be so easy to overlook, and yet it's still another sign of the presence of God in Elijah's life, despite where Elijah is. So again, off of bread and water, Elijah continues on 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. Now, just a little side fact and an asterisk, Mount Horeb is the exact same place scripture, scripturally where Moses encountered God and received the Ten Commandments. Same place. Forty years is also the amount of years that Israel wandered the wilderness because they weren't obedient to the Lord. And we see here Elijah walking 40 days, 40 nights to get to the same place. So there's significance in these small little pieces, right? It all just starts stitching together. He gets there, and he ends up in this cave. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I don't know about you, but if I were in Elijah's shoes, my gut reaction would be like, What do you mean, what am I doing here? You told me to come here. You made me walk 40 days and 40 nights with bread and water to get here. And you're asking me, I should be asking you what the heck I'm doing here. Like, you tell me, dude, like, I'm tired. I'm, I just, I was praying for my death like 40 days ago. And you made me, you just, you just adding, you rubbing salt in the wound right now. Because I've had 40 days to think about all this stuff and how bad my life is. To the point where he responds back to the Lord, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And they want to kill me too. So we can see here that Elijah is still struggling with the fallout from these events that he's walked through. Even after these miraculous encounters with the Lord, Elijah is still in this place where he's like, these people just don't get it, and I'm done. I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore, because all they want to do is kill me, and all these people that you sent me to save, the mission that you sent me to do is failing. So the Lord said, step outside. Not in fisticuffs kind of way. So he says, step outside. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains, broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Imagine you're like on Cocoa Head, and you're watching all of the Ko'olaus get decimated right now. And after the wind, an earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But as you can see here, the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. Because after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, went outside, and stood at the entrance of the cave. See, now here's the piece here. When we're going through rough times, when our circumstances are not ideal, when we're seeking an encounter from the Lord from that place and we're looking for a solution to our problem, a lot of the times we expect an encounter to show up and look and feel a certain way. That applies to me. Because Lord, no offense, but healing my ankle, not going to help my marriage. Seeing a generous donation is not going to fix my relationship with my kid. I need you to show up here, right here. Amen. 
Elijah, who had seen just about the biggest miracles I think that God has ever really done, revival, provision, signs and wonders, he wouldn't, it would be fair for him to expect God to show up in a huge monumental way again, because it's exactly what he'd done before. But the thing is, God's desire for encounter is not to resolve Elijah's problem. It's to draw Elijah back into his present. Now, don't get me wrong. A huge wind that blows up mountains, an earthquake and a fire, pretty undeniable signs from the Lord. But sometimes it isn't those big monumental pieces that we need. It's that gentle whisper. And immediately upon hearing this gentle whisper, Elijah wraps his face, steps outside, because he knows, as opposed to the three things that just happened in the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, he recognizes the presence of the Lord in that whisper. See, the beautiful part about this, God knows exactly what we need better than we know ourselves. While we might be looking for the Lord in the wind, the earthquake, the fire, the big circumstantial shifts, the big problem-solving movements, sometimes he's whispering in your ear in the quiet of the night, begging for you to hear him. But we can be too focused on God showing up a certain way in a certain area that we completely miss the whisper. Good point. Good point. And so in this conversation with the Lord, the Lord asks him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is ex the exact same interaction that just happened. And as you can imagine, for those of you who have ever really felt the presence of the Lord in your life, it could be the exact same words, but the heart of humility comes out. Out of sheer shock, you're just like, I don't even, I don't even know what to do right now, but here's the thing that's still on my heart because this is what's been bugging me, so I'm going to say that again. And what does the Lord say in response to him? Go. Return on your way back to Damascus. It says to go out and anoint a couple, uh, anoint the future kings of Israel and Judah, pick up Elisha, mentor him to become your successor as the pro as my prophet. In First Kings nineteen nineteen, after this interaction, it simply just says, "So Elijah departed." Notice here, though, Elijah's circumstances are exactly the same. Nothing has changed. Ahab is still king. Jezebel still wants to kill him. The prophets are all still dead. And yet here Elijah is returning back to the mission field that the Lord had called him to. Why? Because the Lord in this moment, in this interaction, in this encounter, reminded Elijah of who he was. Drew him back to be in his presence, right? Because when we're in his presence, when we're in relationship with the Lord and we grow our trust and our faith in him, obedience just flows naturally. It wasn't a great display or sign or wonder or miracle. It was the gentle, quiet whisper of the Lord that breathes life back into Elijah. See, because the power of the encounter is not what it manifests physically, what it looks like. It's simply about us drawing back to the love of God, stepping back into his presence. And Elijah is a very encouraging, humbling story that even the most faithful followers of God can struggle with this. But God never abandons 
He never stops chasing after us, never stops desiring to draw us closer, never stops desiring encounter with us. So what do we do with that? We know that God desires to encounter us and that he can encounter us anywhere. But the thing is, is that we also know that the enemy will do anything he can to stop us. And so these application steps this week might seem a little similar. But I really feel it's because the Lord wants to impress upon our hearts the need for us to have an encounter with him. So first things first, ask for an encounter. See, we know that, again, God desires to have an encounter with us. We need to meet him in that space. Receive the revelation from the Lord in those moments. God is faithful to meet us, and he's always wanting to speak to us. Now, how it looks to you might look completely different to how it looks to me. It might feel different. For some of us, it might be a picture, an illustration. It might be a word of scripture. It might be a word of encouragement. It might even be just an emotion. You might just need to feel and experience the love of God again. It doesn't matter what the revelation looks like, simply that we receive it. And the next big piece about this, write it down. Because in those moments where it feels like encounter is impossible to come by, sometimes all it takes is seeing the way that the Lord has been faithful to encounter us before. And out of this, choose the way of Jesus. See, the power of encounter is that encounter is an example of the kingdom of God breaking through onto earth to reveal to us the spiritual reality that Jesus is from. And we're called to walk in that reality, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of the Lord. See, now this, all of this, I have to admit, is, it was a struggle to get through, even for me. Because encounter does feel very far off sometimes. And as I was sitting, prepping, I found myself in the same place. Of like, Lord, it's, it's been a minute. I've been doing a whole lot of stuff, running at 100 miles an hour. Might have skipped some of the things to do with you. I could really use an encounter like right now to help with this. And it was funny because as I was sitting down and Pastor Keen had given me a call and we were just talking about something, he reminded me this like, Matt, you, you know you encounter God a lot through the word. And after that, I just started to sit and I started to think about that. And I remembered that, you know, when I first started coming to church, really starting to make my faith my own, we're taught to Devo. You go, you read your Bible, you write in the journal. For some of you guys, I mean, for me, it was soap, scripture, observation, application, prayer. And I was, man, I was so good at that. Dude, every day I'd come over here, I'd go down to the fountain downstairs. I had a journal literally almost every single day for like an entire year written. 300 and like 40 applications as to how to be a better Matt Sujimura, how to be a better Christian, how to live a better life. And I remember sitting there after needing to figure out what book I wanted to read next. And I was like, Lord, what good is 340 applications? Like, I can't even do that. It's impossible. Like my life is just gonna become rules and following rules and abiding by rules. And as I was sitting there thinking to myself, this is, I don't even know what to do with this. This feels impossible. The Lord just had me open up my Bible, open up to Matthew 1. And in the very beginning of Matthew 1 is the genealogy of Jesus. And I started reading this. And I'd, I had read this thing three, four times before. 
actually, let me rephrase that. I had skipped over this part of the, of the Bible three or four times before. Because you start reading it, right? And you're like, okay, cool. Like, this dude is the father of that dude who sired that dude who led to that dude, you know? It's like, okay, cool. And then, like, yeah, sick. We ended up with Jesus. But as I started to actually read it for the first time, I started to recognize the names. Because I had done my devos for the last year and seen every single one of these people. I had seen their story. Albeit I'd seen how messed up some of them were too. But the thing was, is in that moment, the Lord was like, Matt, this is my story. This is who I am. This is what led to me. When you devo, it's not about learning how to be a better you. It's not learning how to live a better life. When you're diving into the word with me, it's an opportunity to grow with me, to learn who I am. The example that comes to mind is, after all of this, I, if I equated it to my marriage, it's like I had 340 different ways to love my wife, but I didn't actually know my wife at all. And so in that moment, in that little encounter, God has shifted my entire devotions, my entire approach to not ask, well, Lord, what are you trying to teach me right now? To, Lord, what am I learning about you? See, and I want to encourage you, though, because for me, I encounter God the strongest when I'm reading the word. For you, it could be worship. For you, it could be prayer. It could be in community. It could be alone. God desires encounter for each and every single one of us, regardless of our age, regardless of whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we're, whether we're you know, constantly in small group, whether we're serving a lot, whether we're not serving a lot, it doesn't matter. None of these things, qualifiers do not exist when it comes to encountering Jesus. And I just feel like there are some of us here today who feel like encounter just isn't my thing. I'll continue doing and living my life and becoming a little bit better here and there. Encounters, mm, I don't know. I don't encounter people the way that I feel like God encounters people. But I just want to encourage you. God encounters every single one of us. He always has, and he'll never stop. And there's a beauty in being able to take some time to sit and listen for the whisper. Will you pray with me? Father God, Lord, we just come before you in thanks for your faithfulness, for your presence in our lives. for your desire, not for a better me, not for an improved version, but for me as I am right here and right now. Lord, I ask for those of us in the room right now that need an encounter with you, Lord, I ask that you would encounter us right now. I ask that you would make your presence undeniably clear. That it's so strong that I know it has to be you. Lord, help to sear this moment on my life. So that even in the lowest of lows that I'll remember that you are always present. That you are always desiring me. All these things we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.